I gave you in writing. That is why I gave you in writing permission. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You did. You, did. Has, course, you never know when uh, these agencies ask you, did you seek permission or not, etc., etc. Anyway. That, this is also for the information of the audience who have joined that we have, will be recording the meeting. And it is basically because of them so that we can upload the lectures and some of them, they sometimes drop the calls due to poor internet connectivity and all. So they can go and revisit those lectures whenever they want to. And by the number of views that we have seen on our YouTube channel, we yeah. have seen that some of the lectures have been seen 200 to 250 times in a couple of days only. So that oh. means there are uh, uh, participants and other people going back and re revisiting those lectures, so, which is a good thing. Yeah, it is. It is. I mean, give me a second, I'll get come back. Yes, sir. Sure. Good afternoon, Anandita. You have to unmute yourself. This is the greatest privilege of this system that the student can mute us. Yes. <laughs> Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mayank. Welcome to Interprista College. <laughs> yeah, virtually I'm there. Yes, of course you are there. Thank you very much for taking your time out. No, no, no. It's an honor to be there. And uh, I never thought that we'll be visiting uh, IP college in such a manner <laughs> in virtual form. <laughs> <laughs> mm. But anyway, what I was thinking is that when the election comes, what will we do? We'll meet in virtual meetings. Let's see. New normal. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> new normal. Let's see. Let's see. Are you part of that? No. I'll call you later on. There's a yes, group, the group has been called, uh, formed to mm -hmm. sort of certain issues of Delhi University at the moment. We'll discuss that. Because fortunately, Delhi sure, University has sure. yesterday notified our history uh, syllabus for the third semester after a month. Oh. Yeah, fortunately, it's there. So we'll be discussing that. We have uh, introduced a few new things. We'll be sharing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm okay, a we'll discuss those things in, uh, in a different forum, perhaps. Yes. Yes. Hmm? Hello. Naveen, are we ready to start? Uh, hello. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, we are waiting for a couple of more participants to join. Participants. I think most of them okay. will be joining in like a, a minute or two, and then we will just begin. Mm -hmm. Right. We have already discussed and, and set up the presentation for sir, so we have checked that part. And uh, we'll just. Okay, excellent. I mean, we were doing a presentation in Tin Murti, and mm -hmm. uh, and we were recording it also. Suddenly, there were a few people who started started uh, started uh, shouting slogans. Mm -hmm. And they, For? they there was some issue on the uh, Gita Press presentation was on Gita Press, and their mm -hmm. only purpose was to be seen in the camera that they are shouting. They were here there, and once they shouted those slogans, then they went out. They were least bothered about what is being presented. Oh. That's all. Oh. So this is the latest toy to play with. Yes, perhaps. 
कैमरा दिखा और दो स्लोगन लगाए उन्होंने और फिर वो बाहर हो गए एंड वी रियली गॉट वरीड की दे माइक क्रिएट सम काइंड ऑफ प्रॉब्लम और रेज ऑब्जेक्शन इज बॉदर अबाउट दैट दे शुड देयर प्रेजेंस एंड देन दे लेफ्ट द वेन्यू राइट any update on when we are going to get our first semester students no idea i am just where you are in total darkness absolutely in total darkness <laughs> <laughs> still doing those op evaluation fortunately i am not taking third year so i am spared oh oh i did my undergraduate third year and now the ma lot has also come The M A lot has also come. Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. M A final year lot. Yeah, you are taking this semester. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm saved. <laughs> 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 it's not easy. It's not easy. To it's wait okay. on things. It's, it's okay, huh? And we were worried about the language students. Those who are doing language, mm -hmm. they were literally worried that how we are going to mark them and how. I don't know, but perhaps this is new normal. These are all part of new normal. It is. It is. It is. So, uh, with your permission, sir, I think we can begin now. No, me. इतने पंक्चुअल हम लोग कभी नहीं हुए क्लास में जितने यहाँ हो जाते हैं. Uh, so uh, good afternoon everyone i would like to welcome the speaker of today's session dr mayank kumar uh, dr anandita roy saha coordinator center for earth studies all the faculty members present and are you okay i'm not audible okay am i not audible, audible now no you are okay so good afternoon everyone i'll just repeat myself quickly i would like to welcome the speaker of today's session uh, dr mayank kumar dr anandita roy saha coordinator center for earth studies and all the faculty members present and the participants uh, in this lecture session under the theme global climate change on behalf of the department of environmental studies and the ip college community i would like to extend my sincere thanks to dr mayank kumar for agreeing to deliver a talk in this session uh, it is my privilege to introduce him to all the participants dr mayank kumar teaches history at satyavati college uh, university of delhi his research interests pertain to exploration of human nature relationships during the early modern times He was associated with Decision Center for Desert City at his Arizona State University as Fulbright Fellow to work on climate change and water issues. He was a fellow at Nehru Memorial Museum and Library, New Delhi, to examine the issues associated with social stratification and the politics of natural resources management before availing UGC National Research to explore humans and natural world, a study in the social perceptions, interactions, and responses in the 17th and 18th century Rajasthan. He is a visiting faculty at Department of Environmental Studies, University of Delhi, and Shiv Nagar University, Uttar Pradesh. Along with several articles published in reputed journals, Dr. Kumar has a monograph, Monsoon Ecologies, Irrigation, Agriculture, and Settlement Patterns in Rajasthan during the Pre-Colonial Period, to his credit. Sir, I am sure that we all are going to benefit immensely from your decades of teaching and research experience. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Naveen. Thank you for the generous introduction. uh and thanks anandita for giving me this opportunity we welcome welcome to interpreter college mayank and you will be happy to know that in this course we are having participants from all over india that's great students from undergraduate postgraduate and research levels have joined and i'm sure you have a lot to do, you know address to our young generation who are our hope for the future i will be focus with them only because yes. we, are, we are trying our best but it is still insufficient and we require better support from the new generation yes. and across the nation we require them uh, uh allow me over to, to you man please thank you anandita thank you uh, allow me to first of all uh, uh, convey my thanks to anandita and the team which has invited me for this lecture uh before beginning with the uh, presentation and discussion let me point out two things two important things one this is not going to be a lecture it should be kind of a dialogue uh i am a historian primarily working on early medieval times uh, early modern times matlab pre modern times i'm working on that period so uh, uh, my formulations or my uh, ideas are primarily emanating from that that era so there might be a some kind of disjunction which you feel but 
uh, in my understanding, that era gives us lesson or gives us some kind of insight how to mitigate how to mitigate the present climate crisis. We are cutting, uh, calling it crisis. We'll be discussing that later on. But before that, uh, let me also say that as a teacher of Delhi University, uh, we few have started a group called Teachers Against Climate Change, and recently even Anandita has joined us. Uh, it was an uh, an effort on our part to uh, start discussing the issue of climate crisis at college level. Our another concern was that the kind of course which is being taught at undergraduate level in the name of environmental studies is primarily environmental science and it focuses only on pollution and it doesn't integrate the social sciences with the science. So our concern was that climate change has a scientific understanding, but climate change also influenced by the social stratification, social conditions, economic condition, political institutions. So we need to integrate. It cannot be solved scientifically. The society has to come forward. Society has to be taught, uh, shared uh, new insights, new scientific development, and the problem associated with the kind of living we are very used to at the moment. This effort uh, got uh, uh, into trouble because of the COVID, as you all know. In that process, we started uh, few starting organizing few webinars, and there have been series of webinars somebody exploring the issue of nitrogen in the climate crisis, somebody is, is ensuring the, it was exploring the issue of carbon emissions, somebody was exploring the issue of the long-term uh, climate variability in what ways capitalism and the issues with the heaven playing an important role. Along with this teacher thing is climate crisis, we have also uh, proposed, and it's in the beginning, that a group called Youth Against Climate Crisis. And the Delhi University students are uh, managing it. Our purpose was that these students, once they complete their graduation or post graduation, they will migrate to new areas and they will carry this sensibility with them. So there are two groups which are functioning at the moment. One is Teachers Against Climate Change and the other is Youth Against Climate Change. I invite you all to be part of that because uh, this, is, this problem cannot be solved by sitting few in Delhi or in New York. It has to be dealt at local level as well. In my presentation, I will be coming back to the local, the importance of local as well. So I will be sharing the detail of this. This simply teaches against climate change. Recently, we have developed a YouTube channel also where we are putting our uh, these uh, webinars which we are conducting. More important is that the kind of literature we are sharing, the kind of research we are trying to share, and expecting that students, teachers, participants like you, they carry it forward, convert into their own language in simple languages communicate with the society, communicate with the uh, peer group, and then spread the word that the climate crisis is as much a crisis of the social institutions, which needs to be rebuilt. I'm not going to get the details, but the, the kind of problems which COVID has exposed us to, there's a lot to be un, uh, learned from COVID. And the kind of responses which we have received, even that makes us understand that the kind of development we have followed there are problems with that there are issues with that and we must we must this is the time and we where we must intervene and try to solve try to uh, revisit our priorities try to uh, search for new alternatives in what ways this crisis can be uh, understood and mitigated and managed so let me begin formally with my presentation but please feel free to interrupt me any moment of time it's a bit of historical in the beginning. So if you have any query, just stop me because this lecture uh, uh, doesn't have anything very novel or very, very exotic to discuss. It simply tries to argue that climate crisis is, uh, should be seen in multiple ways. There is no one clear narrative of climate crisis. Only emission is not important or only developers are not, uh, developer is not important. Even developing countries are now contributing to the climate crisis. So the various dimensions through which the climate crisis has to be seen is will be discussed in this uh, lecture. So wherever you have any query, please come and ask a question on that. As you all know, I have titled this as climate change, 
the genesis and alternatives. So primary focus is on genesis. There's a primary reason for that because I'm a historian, so I will be focusing on that. But uh, the alternatives can be seen in the genesis. The way we have developed that shows that as the view, uh, as the way how to proceed further. For us. Uh, uh, if you have read the abstract which I have shared for this lecture, I have tried to uh, locate the climate crisis in terms of Anthropocene. So I will be moving towards Anthropocene. But before that, uh, even in Anthropocene has several kind of understanding, several kind of definition for that. And uh, a few uh, historians and few uh, theoreticians place beginning of Anthropocene with the agriculture. Because agriculture is a man-made uh, activity. It's not natural activity. So the agriculture is also seen as the beginning of Anthropocene, but most agree that it is the Industrial Revolution and the later half of the 18th century. That is the marker or that is the uh, period when we see transition from the earlier eras to a new kind of energy use, new kind of uh, geological age can be seen with the beginning of Industrial Revolution. There have been industries prior to Industrial Revolution. When I say Industrial Revolution, this is 18th century, Western Europe, primarily Britain. And uh, another word for that will be the use of fossil fuel, the, this energy being replaced with the fossil fuel. This new energy regime has a different connotation. This changes the whole world. You, you, you will appreciate that if I share one of my experiences. Uh, a couple of years back, we were traveling to Pengong Lake, which is now disputed at the moment, and there was a landslide. Fortunately, unfortunately, uh, before us, our army convoy was moving. So the army convoy also got stopped. And I started, uh, came down of the bus and moved towards the place where the landslide has taken place. There was a massive rock which has come on the road. And army, because it has also, it was also with they there. So they took out their rods, their bale chars, and they were trying to push that rock. The issue with the rock was that it, the volume was not great. But the mass was very great. It was very heavy rock. Not more than 15 soldiers could put pressure together because of the, uh, the volume of the uh, rock. And it took almost one and a half hour for all the soldiers to push it to the ditch, to the other side of the road. And we were wondering if there had been one, one JCB, it would have taken only a second. Just, the JCB would have crushed it and thrown it there. This transition in energy use is very was very revealing for me the process which should have taken a second even the army men were taking a longer time which means in other words our capacity to do work or our capacity to modify earth or our capacity to puff, to change the landscape has uh, enhanced tremendously it's gone beyond our imagination, the way we can change the climate, uh, change the landscape, not the climate. This new energy regime, when begin, it also replaced our dependence on muscle power. In other words, if I, uh, uh, it may be a bit controversial, but that has to be discussed with you. Uh, if you, you, most of you might be aware that uh, Roman Empire witnessed slave mode of production. In India, we never witnessed slave mode of production, but slavery was always there in India. Uh, but the slavery in Indian context, slavery in Eastern part was very different from the slavery in Western uh, part of the world. Because we have the slave kings as well. So slave all over different categories in Indian context, in the Eastern context, but not in the Western context. Even in Western context, there is chattel slavery and other kind of slavery. When I use the term slavery, or when I use the term uh, the caste system, both these systems for me are system to manage the energy resources. In the absence of fossil fuel, the primary source of energy was muscle power, be it animals or humans. But when we compare humans with animals, it was the humans who was energy with intelligence. So the societies or the it was inherent in the structure of the society which was evolving to try to channelize the human energy. And in the process, they were trying to control the human energy. There was stratification in the society and the upper class or the upper caste, they were trying to control the energy resources of the common man. It was a struggle for the greater energy resources. You will be surprised that unlike slavery, slavery or production or slavery, 
the caste system was much more potent and much more prevailing. It controlled our psyche. It was ingrained in our psyche that we are to serve the upper caste. Kabir, the famous Kabir Das, was a revolutionary poet. He was a revolutionary social reformer. But time and again in his poetry, he writes that, I'm, I'm Jati Chamara. I belong to the lowest caste. And I cannot transcend this. In the social structure, I just cannot transcend this barrier. Unlike slavery, who can purchase his freedom. But here you cannot. You are born in a caste and then you remain in that caste. That was the power of caste system. In my understanding, caste system was a mean to control the energy resources. There was benefit of it and there are uh, 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 there, there, there were negatives of uh, this system also. We'll be discussing that in a later, later, later context. But please remember that. At the same time, the fastest mode of transportation and communication was horse. Fastest mode of transportation and communication was horse. Though we have developed tremendously, but this development has led to severe cost for the uh, climate. And that is why I say we place, we few students place industrial revolution as the marker of beginning of Anthropocene. Uh, are you, I hope everybody is aware of what is, what is Anthropocene. I hope everybody is aware of Anthropocene. Can you see the responses? Or should I begin with this? Yes, Radhika. Thank you, Radhika. OK. So when we say this, uh, use the term Anthropocene, we were trying to locate it somewhere with the beginning of industrial revolution. That can be def defined the geological age in terms of contribution of human energy, Anthropocene. Right. <clears throat> the greatest limitation on, and, uh, on muscle power was that it cannot function, it cannot continuously work 24 hours, seven days a week. Unlike a machine, it cannot work beyond 12 to 13 or 14 hours at the most. If I give you an example from the Mughal Empire, the Mughal army was a basically cavalry, cavalry driven. Horses were the mainstay of the Mughal army in the initial stages till again gunpowder is introduced. So that cavalry, the good soldier was considered or the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the ideal soldier was the person who had three horses, who had to maintain three horses. Because once you, you were wearing all the uh, cover of the iron, the, the whole horse was covered with the iron and you charged to the army. But when you come back, your horse was exhausted. So you shift to another horse. Once again, you charge and come back. You shift to a third horse. By the time you have come back from the third horse, your first horse will, will be ready. So three aspa or three horse was the ideal for the Mughal army. That also shows us the limitation of the muscle power of the horse. I have a slide later on where we argue that the kind of energy cons consumption and the energy output, human's output is around 18% what we consume, whereas horse produces only 10% what they, what they consume. So the, there was a limitation on the uh, energy resources. With the introduction of in a new energy regime, with the introduction of a steam engine, now a steam engine can function 24 hours, seven days a week. And it's a major change. It's a major change. Though initially they were very, very inefficient. Uh, almost 99% of energy was lost in the initial in the steam engines. But the contribution which they made later on, that was very, very tremendous. Even when they were 99% inefficient, even then they could work 24 hours, seven days a week. Please try to understand the implication of that 24 hour, seven days a week. The implication is that you require greater amount of energy resources. In this context, it is the coal which you require. You require coal regularly to uh, make this machine, machine function. You will run your machine empty. No, you want to produce something. If you want to produce something, you regularly require raw material, which means landscape has to be changed. It has to produce sufficient raw material for the machine to convert into finished good. If you're finishing continuously producing goods, continuously producing good, the next problem with you is where are you going to get it consumed? Because everybody knows the basic rule of economics that if you supply more 
goods in the market, the prices will crash. If prices will crash, your margin of profit will crash. So what you require, you not only require mass production, but you also require market, the development of market. And this is what those who are aware can all relate it with the foldism. We'll be discussing that later on as well. That is the foldism. You develop market also. Why are you developing this market? Because you have made investment in that new energy regime in the steam engine. Steam engine are costly affair. They are labor, in, uh, they are energy in intensive. They are capital intensive. Because you have invested large amount of capital in the develop on, uh, development of uh, steam engine, a steam which is uh, a steam engine which is produced, uh, uh, which is basically of iron. So you have developed iron industry as well. That investment you want to get the return out of it. You want to make profit out of that. To make profit, you have to run it continuously because unless you run it 24 hours seven, you will not be able to recover the cost which you have invested there. Which means the problem is not with the, it's a controversial statement, but the problem is not with the energy resources. Energy resources you are using, energy resources on themselves are not producing energy or they are not polluting the environment. It's we who are using it. So it is the capitalism coupled with industrialization. Capitalism coupled with industrialization where the primary motive is to produce or is to generate as much profit as possible. So this new energy regime in an era of capitalism is very, very important. Please don't segregate these two. If you segregate these two, you will not come to correct historical conclusions. Industrial revolution in the absence of capitalism would not have survived. Capitalism in the absence of industrial revolution also would not have survived the way it has survived. So what I'm trying to suggest with you that industrial revolution is an important marker of capitalism also. It is industrial revolution because you are moving to new kind of energy resources we are, where you are producing mass goods and then you are developing the market. Those who have studied history, they can very easily relate the emergence or the, 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 the uh, greater colonization of 17th and 18th century. The kind of colonization of, East, uh, of Europe, of, of uh, initially Asia and then later on Africa took place was product of this. Your quest for energy resources, your quest for raw material and your quest for market. These three were coupled and which led to a new kind of energy regime, which is taking over. Let me give one more example. Perhaps that will make what I'm trying to say much clearer. There are evidences, historical evidences that the ships carrying the textile from England heading towards India, what they used to do, they used to dump all the textile into the English channel and they used to go back. It was cheaper for them to dump that production inside the sea rather than taking that uh, textile to Indian market and which might have led to the crash of prices. To maintain the margin of prices, to maintain the, uh, the their ma margin of profit, they used to dump the entire, entire textile production into the uh, sea. It was cheaper for them. What is being dumped? The raw material. What is being dumped? A kind of modified landscape. We call it agrarian landscape. You are producing greater amount of cotton at the cost of cereals, which were required by the human being in India. You can recall Gandhiji's uh, famous uh, Indigo movement in, uh, sorry, forgetting the name, this North Bihar, uh, where, where he went to uh, argue, uh, uh, fight for the uh, Indigo farmers. Yes, who's giving the name? Champaran. Thank you very much. Sorry, it's just slipped out of my mind. Yeah, Champaran. That Champaran movement. Yes. Yeah. That Champaran uh, uh, Andolan, the Champaran movement of Gandhiji was primarily trying to restore the basic subsistence agriculture production in that area. The peasantry was arguing that we are forced to cultivate indigo for the English textile. Because the scientific, uh, the, the, the uh, artificial synthetic indigo was yet to develop. Which means you are replacing the primary agrarian production with the 
production of raw material. You are producing that raw material because your industry requires that. An industry which doesn't require it's your margin of quest for margin of profit that requires that kind of investment or that kind of drive towards that. The precursor, the, the precursor uh, industrial revolution was based on the putting out system. Those were aware simply uh, they were trying to uh, establish factory, factory not in the same sense of as we understand industry, factory where workers were working in three to uh, four shifts. They were coming, working, and then they leaving. The impact of that was the labor was segregated from their production tools, from the tools of production. From the artisan, they were converted into labor. Now they don't own, don't, they don't have any control over the production system. They were simply coming to the factory and whatever being asked by the uh, industrialist or by the capitalist to produce, they were working on that. They had no control over what is being produced, how it is being produced. They were only available. They were only form of uh, energy resource who were coming to the factory in shifts. That shift is experience that humans cannot work beyond uh, eight to twelve hours. So that is why there were shifts of labor, which ultimately replaced by the steam engine, which is the working twenty-four hour, seven weeks a day. The same period also uh, witnessed the global networks of raw material and market. Around 1850, you are, uh, 1750, you are well aware that America was almost about to get independent. 1776, USA declares independence. And by 1818, by 1812, they declare that we will not allow any kind of European intervention in either of North America or South America. We'll protect South America and North America, and no European ex uh, intervention is acceptable to us, which means America segregated itself. Both the Americas were segregated. That is why you see greater pressure on eastern side. The colonization of India, the colonization of the whole of uh, Far East, as far as the China and Japan. Initially, they came as a trader. Initially, they came as a trader. But with the two things, two very important things. Two very important things, they changed. One. The Diwani right of Bengal, Bihar, and Odisha, without any responsibility of maintaining the administration, without responsibility of Fajdari. Now, for the first time, what British enjoyed that they were getting revenue from India. From that revenue, they were procuring the Indian goods and exporting that back to England. Because they were getting that revenue almost at a negligible cost, because they have won that area. So the the cost of goods they procured from India was absolutely nothing for them. This generation of wealth leads to further industrialization in England. Because in England, now this capital which is coming from India was to be invested. Where to invest that? If you invest that capital in the trade, the market will collapse. The margin of profit will collapse. So the other option with them was to reduce the cost of production. How will you reduce the cost of production? Let me give a very um, uh, contemporary example. The way banks are establishing ATMs, it's not to ensure 24 hour supply of money to the customer. It is to replace the human labor, which was working in the banks. Now you have installed ATM machines, which means that person is replaced. The person who required salary, the person who required uh, uh, life insurance, the person who required health insurance, the person who required leave, the person who required pension benefit, all that is being replaced. And the banks are enhancing their profit simply by installing, simply by moving towards installation of ATM machines. This seems to be very convenient, but they're coming at the cost of the human who were working there and now they are being replaced with the ATMs. Similarly, what they were trying to do in Britain with this capital which they have generated from India, which they have got from India, they were investing it in the industries, greater industrialization. That is what I'm saying. The industry has to be located in terms of along with the capitalism. Their quest for maximizing the profit forced them or compelled them or uh, invited them in a greater investment in the industry. 
that industry which is running 24 hours 7 requiring raw material ultimately that raw material requires market so the global interconnections are now much more closer you cannot leave this system because something is being produced something being cultivated here convert into finished goods somewhere here and sold somewhere else so that global interconnections is now we called globalization only in the 1990s but the kind of globalization which is visible in the beginning of the 19th century is is, is, is the foundation on which the modern day globalization is uh, functioning shipping industry i'm not going to the details i'm not going to the details of railway you are aware of that what is the importance of that and why we need to examine that all these are primarily systems of mass transportation mass transportation which changes the whole course of historical understanding of processes through which we are changing the uh, landscape and changing the global context but the story will be partial if we don't examine in the context of growth in population. Extensive growth in population is also important consideration for us to understand because growth in population means growth in market. We see in terms of population explosion, but for the capitalist, this is generation of market. This is the creation of market. So they are heavily invested they were heavily investing in the medical sciences so that the greater amount of population can be maintained this transition please understand i'm trying to offer a generalization there are nuances there are exceptions there are variations but for a better for a, uh, a greater for a neat narrative i'm just eliminating those uh, exceptions i'm trying to focus uh, I'm trying to give a, a bigger picture to you. Growth in population means the growth in the consumption also, the creation of market. And imagine and see at the, uh, the, 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 the last table. Between 1950s and 1990s, we have almost doubled. This is the market. And this market requires greater industrial production. Please also understand this is the phase when you see beginning of nation states initially and then the nationalism a nation state and nationalism i'm not going to details of these two aspects but remember that in the growth of capital system uh, capitalist system to for uh, just a second the data is primarily data is primarily uh, procured from the uh, john mcneil's book uh, something new under the sun I have shared the details in the bibliography. Something new under the sun. This is another data which simply says that in what ways the wealth has increased, the global economic wealth has increased from 100 in 1500 CC to 11,664 uh, by 1992. This economic growth is primarily based on greater exploitation of nature and natural resources not only the industrial production but to sustain that industrial production the agrarian production was also modified if you uh, if i just uh, give a summary of this uh, slide then perhaps uh, i have already discussed this but you will understand in what ways this transition has impacted the globe what we have been doing shifting to a different kind of energy regime and that energy regime has forced us or created kind of atmosphere where our requirement of raw material and our requirement of market is multiplying regularly and it is continuously giving us new kinds of incentive for greater consumption for more and more consumption these are the basic details for your record that in what ways energy efficiency has been playing an important role in this context uh, uh, we need to emphasize another dimension which is very very crucial for us to understand because that changes the course of historical development in the 20th century that is the uh, extensive use on of, of oil dependence on oil oil 
and especially when the oil started uh, uh, the, the human was able, was able to discover the gushers the the oil which is coming naturally out from the earth the gushers was discovered in texas area these gushers oil gushers uh the cost of producing oil as a source of energy is very very minimal please understand this is this is very crucial the cost of producing oil is naturally available naturally available you only need to extract it refine it and while refining the raw material or the, the, the waste material which is being produced has other kind of industrial uses to so the oil with the discovery of oil new kind of new kind of energy regime is unleashed and that is primarily based on as john ory calls free lunch that all oil was almost free it is the cost involved in it was very very meager very very meager so what is happening that you have got a source of energy which produces or in terms of energy efficiency which is the greatest if you compare crude oil with the natural gas with the coal you realize that the crude oil average is about 43 uh, megajoule whereas natural gas is only 35 and fish or gives you only 6 megajoule of the energy in terms of efficiency so what oil is giving you oil is giving you greater access to energy resources and that energy resources once again require greater demand greater demand for the raw material very soon it became very visible it became very clear that this production of uh, energy resources require consumption also this was very clearly very cleverly realized by ford and we witnessed the beginning of foldism uh this is for the your detail for the sake of your uh, record only i'm, I'm not going to detail of that i'm more from much more country uh, concerned about foldism what foldism does integrates labor with the industrial production integrates labor with the industrial production and what do i mean by that mass production and mass consumption is clubbed together with the foldism you are paying a higher salary to your employee not because you are very benevolent not because you want a favor to them you you are giving them good salary because your primary source of energy is almost the cost of that energy is negligible so your energy is almost negligible available with you so your cost of production has declined so you can you are selling goods at a higher cost you are not reducing the cost of the production but you are sharing that profit with the labor and there is a purpose for that when you share that with the labor what you are doing you are making them as a market you are converting them into a market this creation of market creates new kinds of demands new kinds of demand i have not cited here but there is a uh, uh, very interesting argument by uh, richard uh, richard tucker in settable appetite where he argues that all this oil oil led automobile could sustain only because of the availability of synthetic rubber had it not been available this whole automobile industry would have collapsed there were experiments made in the java sumatra experiments made on the western coast of africa to cultivate rubber plantations so that the automobile industry could sustain itself but uh, for me what is important is that automobile industry it's only car which is visible to us what is not visible to us is the kind of raw material which goes into the making of the car which goes into the making of that whole uh, paraphernalia which we call automobile industry i give you a give you example of uh, the rubber that which was naturally available unless that was synthetically developed there was limitation on the automobile industry you were developing ford model of development in your uh, in america but you were not able to get uh, rubber plants from american uh, continent so we're procuring it from the java sumatra region and western coast of africa which means there are global interconnections and they are increasing the cost of production they are increasing the emission also they are increasing the pollution also 
they are increasing a, some kind of monocropping also. You cannot cultivate what you want to cultivate. You are forced to cultivate only rubber because that is required by the uh, automobile industry of America, which means the foldism at another level creates a different kind of market, different kind of interconnections. When American market is getting saturated, they are developing the European market. They are developing the Canadian market. And by 1990s, they are developing the markets of the developing countries as well. So there is a close link between capitalism and expansion of consumerism. Unless you, unless you promote consumerism, you will not be able to sustain your capitalism or your industrialization. This quest for greater investment is primarily your quest for greater, greater profit, not for the benevolence of the common man, but for your own greater profit. There are counter arguments that unless the industrialization takes place, we will not have enough uh, agrarian production. To a great extent, I agree with you. But in the recent decade, in Indian context, we have witnessed movement towards uh, organic produce, cereals, organic produce, food. And soon we are realizing that we may not be able to compete with the fertilizer induced agriculture, but we can always manage and maintain and sustain agriculture with the organic production system as well, which means this hype of uh, industrial revolution or hype of uh, fertilizer or hype of artificial irrigation is a hype. If we are able to manage properly, things will be changed. Let me also mention here, and that is very crucial for me to point out, it's not only the capitalism which was focusing on industrialization. Even the whole left world could not see an alternative. They were also seeing in terms of greater industrialization because for them emancipation seems to be visible only in the greater intervention of technology or greater mechanization. The whole five-year five year plans in uh, Russia initially, at the initial stages of uh, after the uh, Russian Revolution and in after Indian independence is primarily greater industrialization. Nehru's vision uh, of uh, these industries as the temple of the modern India, now you question them. But they were driven by a different kind of capitalist mentality or capitalist intention where you are focusing on greater consumption and for that you are focusing on greater production of uh, goods <clears throat> impacts most of you are aware because it's not the undergraduate class degradation of landscape deforestation expansion of agriculture double cropping canals i'm not going to details of that but these are important impacts what is important for me is inequalities that is very important for me to discuss because uh, just a second. Do you have any question at the moment or should I proceed? Is there any question? comments just a second i have not seen what's important okay right silence ca sorry just to find class there uh now it's moving towards a uh, controversial area but that is the focus of this this whole paper inequalities that is important for us to understand. Population growth, we discussed. Population growth, mass production. What we have missed is an important consideration. And that is democratization or the democracy, the emergence of democracy. You all are aware this is primarily 19th century, beginning of the 19th century. And by 20th century, across the world, we have is stressed on we have seen the growth of democracy we define democracy in terms of government by the people for the people of the people but for me democracy is a byproduct of capitalism it's capitalism to sustain itself requires democratization of natural resources when i say democratization of natural resources 
I mean there are two important considerations. One, one is that the uh, the natural resources which are available in a country or in a region that needs to be democratized. There should not be a control of a state only. There should not be control of few select few. In in in, in a monarchy, select few are controlling the natural resources. With the democratization, you get access to those resources by claiming that we will increase the production which will sustain our population which will sustain our citizens which will give better life to our citizens so democratization of natural resources is taking place and by democratization i also mean creation of market it's you all are well aware that it is not economic liberation it's not economic equality when we say democracy it's primarily and primarily political equality only we all as an adult have a right to vote right to constitute the government but we have no control over economic inequalities so democracy when we see or when we examine has only perpetuated economic inequality when i stress on this aspect of economic equality what i mean is that those who are making profit or those who are focusing on private uh, profit that whole capital system where profit was the primary motive they have gradually sidelined or cornered larger portion of profit with them or large portion of resources with them. Go to any country, any country, the most developed or the underdeveloped, you see this disparity. I'm not very comfortable with the data because I'm not going to share the data, but you all are well aware, one data is being shared with you. These inequalities, they ensure multiple things for the better capitalist functioning. One, there is an aspiration that a common man would like to live like a upper class man. That aspiration is very important. The moment you generate that aspiration, you are creating market for your goods. This is a direct relationship between aspiration and the growth of market. So with this disparity, common man is looking towards the okay they enjoy all these things so we must also get that how are we going to get that by reducing the cost of production i agree by reducing the cost of production when you reduce the cost of production you primarily move towards greater free lunch whatever is naturally available you try to extract that use that i have cited the case of <clears throat> oil with you but you can look in terms of forest or in terms of agriculture the land was there for grassland, land was there for wetland, land was there for forest, land was not there for agriculture purposes. We have started agriculture on those lands and we have replaced the flora and fauna of that area. In the name of democratization of natural resources, we have gradually gave access to reserve forest. In the name of development, Whose development? Democratic development. Theoretically, democratic development. But who's making investment? Those who have already cornered large uh, chunk of uh, profit with them. Those who have cornered large chunk of wealth with them. They are invest me, investing in it. Not for the sake of benefit of the common man or democratization of resources. Rather, to make greater profit. And information, information technology plays very important in that. The digital divide which we are witnessing at the moment those who have access to internet and access to the computer they are enjoying this kind of certificate course the the students who cannot afford this cannot be part of this uh, course so those inequalities can be seen or visible at multiple levels numerous levels we need to open to those inequalities because when we start questioning those inequalities we will realize that this agriculture this industrial production which is driven by the maximization of profit has converted us into one of the product of that production system. We are no longer independent human being. Rather, we consume what is being, uh, what is being not uh, thrown upon us or pushed upon us, but what we aspire and that aspiration is now being manufactured, manipulated. The clearest example of that is a Valentine Day. The kind of gift which takes place in the, on the Valentine Day is primarily to produce or, or to encourage the consumption, to encourage the purchase. That cycle has to be broken. 
especially in terms of inequalities, especially in terms of inequalities. When we say it, in inequalities, it's not only inequality within a nation, but inequalities among the nations. I'm not going to detail, uh, share the details of per capita energy consumption in America and per capita uh, energy consumption in India. That energy consumption in India, not in Delhi, but in a rural village. There is a large disparity, large inequality. And that inequality has to be addressed. If you address that, in, that inequality, perhaps we will be in a better position to address the, uh, this whole crisis, which we uh, call it climate crisis. We don't need the kind of production which we are moving towards. We can always change. And those alternatives are nothing but, just a second, those alternatives are nothing but change in our lifestyle, energy intensive lifestyle. I'll come back to this alternative, but before that, let me uh, problematize Anthropocene, because then we will be able to uh, sum up what I'm, I've been trying to argue. When uh, historians, geologists started arguing in terms of Anthropocene, they have classified humans as one agency, humans as, as one agent, humans responsible for the climate change. But as I have been arguing, it's not the humans who are uh, responsible for the climate change or the climate crisis. It is certain section of the humans, certain nations, certain industrialized world who is responsible for the Anthropocene. But they try to justify this climate crisis by proposing the kind of term Anthropocene where the, 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 the regional disparity or regional contribution to the climate crisis is ignored. By a blanket term Anthropocene, you see, you, you say that it's the anthro, uh, humans, anthro, humans who are responsible for the climate crisis. But on a, on, a, on, a, on a closer examination, you realize that all the humans are not responsible. The tribes situated in the Jharkhand area, the tribes situated in the far areas of Andaman, they are not responsible for the Anthropocene. So this category, this category of Anthropocene in itself is a problematic category. This is another tool through which you are trying to manipulate, manage, or change our focus from the climate crisis. It's not the whole humanity which is responsible for the Anthropocene, rather certain sections who are responsible for the uh, uh, Anthropocene. Uh, one example will make it uh, very, very clear. What is the proportion of population who has ever traveled through air? How many Indians have traveled through air? Less than 2%, only less than 2%. 98% have never used aeroplane. So the inequality is playing an important role in the Anthropocene. But by using the term Anthropocene, we are putting blame on all of them. In one of the uh, article, uh, uh, Deepesh Chakravarti argues in terms of provincializing Anthropocene. There are provinces where Anthropocene has been important, but for the other regions, it is not all that uh, the humans have not contributed towards that. So there is a need for us to revisit the whole understanding of Anthropocene. And that can be done only through if we focus on alternatives. And those alternatives are simple. They are nothing unique. We all are aware of that. We need to move from energy intensive lifestyle. We have to, we should, because since simply because oil is available free, almost free with us, does not mean that we keep on over exploiting it. Because we are aware the kind of emission it is creating, that has a problem. We need to move beyond that 24 into 7 mechanism. We need to develop industry, but industry should cater to the equitable distribution of resources, not to perpetuate consumerism. In the same way, globalization is its own benefit, but local is very important. That local, the local lifestyle of your region, of my region, of uh, those who are living in Kerala, those who are living in Northeast, those who are living in Kashmir, that local has to be stressed. Why is it that we want to eat everything which is available globally? We have local produce, we have local uh, food, local fruit, seasonal fruits, why can't we consume them? Simply because they are made available. They are made available not because they are cheaper or 
rather we must uh, uh, we must realize that there is a climate cost of that produce which is being made available to you which is not legally uh, which is not locally produced so that localization of consumption is also very very important we have moved from a uh, coarse cereals to refined cereals and now we are moving towards energy intensive agriculture that has to be changed that can be changed only when we respect our local traditions i am not saying that you should not eat what is available globally but i am saying that you must realize you must uh, consider the environmental cost which that produce is uh, has in inbuilt uh, cost which is inbuilt in that uh, uh, good which you are consuming made available from distant land the other and the last thing is greater use of muscle power we need to move towards that we should move towards greater use of muscle power it reduces our demand for energy we reduce only in terms of energy which is being produced at tehri dam or which is being produced at rawat bhata but we what we don't realize to use that energy resource we need washing machine we need refrigerator we need a uh, dishwasher but all these are product of raw material which has been procured from landscape they generate a tremendous amount of tremendous amount of solid waste it's tremendous amount of solid waste if we replace simply these equipments with the muscle power which we have at our disposal then perhaps will be addressing both the questions the solid waste which is being just, uh, generated and the landscape which has changed i'll conclude you by our uh, citing one of my uh, case study uh, since i have worked on rajasthan area when earlier we used to move from delhi towards jaipur there used to be a small hillocks as soon you reach manisar but now if you travel from delhi to jaipur you will not see any hillocks any hills they all have been converted into our buildings they have reduced they have gone to produce the basic raw material for the building construction activity so we have changed the landscape and we have created this kind of edifice there are alternatives which we move which we have to gradually move towards the primary focus is or the primary consideration for us we must move away from our quest for maximization of profit or maximization of uh, maximum return from our time we need to revisit our priorities and covid has given us the lesson a tremendous lesson to us we all were forced to stay at home during lockdown and we survived i know the common man the daily wager they suffered a lot i am well aware of that well aware of that but there can be other means of other ways of sustenance and covid forced upon us those ways one of that is the kind of interaction we are having at the moment there are uh, solutions in technology and there are solution in changed lifestyle patterns we must move towards that thank you very much Uh, biography. I have shared this, which will be available to you. Uh, yes. I am open to question. I mean, uh, thank you very much, sir, for that really uh, uh, in, uh, informative and enlightening discussion session. Uh, now, the novel, uh, no, so something that really interested me personally a lot was the novel co concept of Fordism. and and to discuss the uh, the common but differentiated responsibility uh, no towards climate change for everybody is very relevant to today's time so if the house has any question i think we are open to that uh, what we can do is that the first question or first query uh, you can just switch on your mic and ask and uh, uh, then and rest of you can just type in your questions in the chat box this uh book fair the january book fair i got hold of this book i'll be sharing the details of that it's very interesting book uh and the the, the question i mean you asked about the fordism it elaborates on that 
and examines the functioning of IMF and World Bank. In what ways they have been sustaining the capitalism and the kind of consumerism which we are witnessing today. I will sh I'll share the detail of this book. This is something that also interests me because uh, you know this is uh, very much a, a, uh, a textbook and a classical classroom concept that we have been studying. That uh, the environmental responsibilities towards environmental conservation or any uh, you know, uh, sort of even biodiversity conservation or combating with pollution, any sort of dealing with any environmental issue, there has to be a common but differentiated responsibility. It is all of ours responsibility and the way you very interestingly took an example of a tribe from Jharkhand. He being from Jharkhand, I can relate to that. So people uh, you know, uh, there, uh, I mean, a lot of them are living in ways which are very much close to nature. And and uh, and if I look at the impact to total and uh, to overall environmental degradation, their impact, those tribal communities, you know, uh, it, is, it is next to minimal. But the companies who are there who are extracting coal, who are extracting you know, bauxite and many other minerals from different areas of Jharkhand, the profit which uh, coming out from natural resources, which should actually have been for, to the to, should have gone to the to the native people, is actually moving out in most of the cases. And uh, true to almost all of the mining states in the entire world, Jharkhand is one of the most poorest you know, state in our country. So, would you suggest some ways in which you know this? whole uh, you know, system can be somehow reversed and the and the, and the benefits of exploiting or utilizing natural resources can go to the native people to the native communities thanks Naveen. very important very important question uh the, the the first and foremost is education that has to be there unless we are aware the functioning of capitalist system we don't realize how we are being exploited in the name of democratic economic development, our resources are extracted and we don't get any benefit of that. Second is we must work for greater standardization or greater strength of our democratic institutions. In the uh, pre previous FRA, Forest Regulation and Regulatory Act, there was a provision of Gram Panchayat permission or the per uh, permission from the local people. If you are going to invest or you are going to modify the land use of that area, Gradually, that democratic power is being uh, taken away from these uh, locality, local common, uh, local men, and they are being transferred to the development agency. That is where we have problem. So this notion of development has to be redefined in terms of greater democratic participation of the common men. And even they should understand that the kind of development which is aspirational development will not work, which should not be their ideal. They realize the importance of their own lifestyle with minor changes in their lifestyle, which will give them better amenities, but they should not become victim of the greater industrial development of their area. Thank you, Thank you sir, for explaining that. I think we'll just wait for a few moments so that they take some time in typing the questions. If you have, if anyone has any immediate question and in your mind, okay, so one is a very long comment. So would you want me to read it or you can you would like to directly I'll take it? I'll read it. It's visible to me. Uh, Nandani, thank you. Thank you for a very interesting question. Uh, let me begin with the personal example. And I'm sorry for that, but uh, that becomes much more easy for me to explain. For last six months, I'm washing the uh, dishes at my home. Before that, I was not doing that. So we are gradually shifting towards muscle power. We are forced to do that. Now we are wiping the floor also, also because my wife is also working. So we share that work. Earlier, there was a maid who was coming and doing this for us. We are transiting from uh, that, that, uh, that, that uh, means we are moving towards greater use of muscle power. The, the, or is uh, there that two two consideration one is if we use public transport that will be the better option for us while using public transportation we have to travel our distance and that distance can be traveled by walking rather than using the taxi or using the auto rickshaw if we travel we'll be using our muscle power and we'll be lessening the uh, carbon emission in that process the second thing 
you will realize that I'm I'm surprised the amount of on the number of <clears throat> treadmills which are being purchased, which are being sold at the moment. In a country like India, where energy is deficient, in the world where which uh, M. S. Swaminathan calls the spaceship called Earth, the resources are limited. In those areas, rather than walking or using our muscles, we depend on the treadmill to make us run. Those treadmills are energy intensive use. We need to change that. The other thing, Nandini, as I said, I will be. I have uh, uh, reduced the uh, exceptions or reduced the other alternate, uh, the other explanations. I agree, and we must realize that with the greater development in in uh, in, in in technology, the amount of energy use or energy efficiency of this product has increased tremendously. Tremendously, the amount of water which is being used in the dishwasher or in the washing machine has been reduced tremendously so there is an argument there is the argument that if you put clothes in the washing machine it will require less amount of water and you will be saving water to an extent i agree with that but the in, in the, the, the kind of energy which that machine will require and its consequences in terms of creation of inequalities and in in changing the landscape that has to be understood two things the tehri dam and the sardar sarovar the kind of displacement they have done we are using energy but at the cost of those tribals who were living in the area and who were displaced from their traditional livelihood patterns so it's not only the question of using greater muscle power but is also contributing towards greater equality or greater equal access of the resources with your co citizens in this area in daily life you have to figure out rather than using elevators we prefer to use staircases wherever possible wherever possible by using these small means we contribute tremendously if you if you accumulate that over a period of time you will realize how much energy consumption you have reduced nish rishwa shekha said the time when we are more and more into making machines to burn here totally agree with you rishwa totally agree with you what is the use of our time that is what the question is that is what i have been trying to argue the maximization of profit we want to maximize the profit of our time as well so it's not only the capitalism or the capitalist class which is which has to be blamed they have inculcated those values among us also and we have become victim of that we see time as a Uh, as a commodity which has to maximize its own profit we we need to revisit that please understand that that is what i'm trying to say in the lifestyle you need to change there should be time enough for you to enjoy yourself to enjoy your neighborhood to enjoy your uh, existence rather than continuously rushing for making greater profit and and profit and profit because by making profit you will be only moving towards greater amenities most of those amenities are artificial are artificial if you closely examine those amenities are artificial if i share one example with you i am in a government uh, college you all know that whenever we are invited to deliver a lecture in a distant part of india i always say i am i will be coming from the train not i will i will not be using aeroplane i could have save time by using aeroplane but by traveling by train i am reducing that carbon footprint on the one hand at the cost of time at the cost of time but during those train travel i get my own leisure time i can read what i have left which i wanted to read but because of the hectic lifestyle i was not able to read so i enjoy those time which is available to me in train and read what i wanted to read forget about reading i enjoy the landscape which is not visible which is not possible when you are traveling by air you can only see for 40 minutes at the most 2 hours but by traveling on the train you enjoy that i know car train also has a carbon footprint but compared to aeroplane it is much less but in terms of time it gives it gives you freedom from your hectic lifestyle and you regenerate yourself by using that time 
So you have to prioritize. What is the importance of your time? I'm not saying that you go back to ancient time. I'm not saying that. But I'm simply saying that what is the purpose of time? In other words, if I borrow a different example, how do we define middle class? And the difference between middle class and the labor class and the working class. One of the definition of this distinction is the availability of time with the middle class. Availability of time for leisure. We go for holiday. We go for a long drive. That is the availability of time. So you need to define what is the purpose of time in your life. Is it to be governed by the capitalist notion of profit making or it has other purposes also? That reorientation, I agree, is a very deep rooted. But if we start moving in that direction, perhaps we will be able to realize that time in itself has become a commodity and we must come out of it. Sanchita, Serbian technology is increasingly becoming the focus of modern development. How do you think can we strike a balance between labor intensive practices and development based in capitalist structure? Difficult question. Sanchita, difficult question. I agree, it's, it's, it's a difficult question. Uh, strike a balance between labor intensive practices and development based in capitalist structure. Oh. Let me uh, let me club two things, Sanchita, and then perhaps I will be able to uh, communicate what I'm trying to say. And I will be sharing with you just a second. Crosby's article. Ecological imperialism. Read that. Ecological imperialism. I mean, I will be sharing this article. I have a soft copy of that. It is forwarded to especially Sanjita, but others can also get access to that. Sure, sir. We, we can yeah. we can also post it on the course website if you wish to. Yes, yes, yes. It, it, it's available with us, sir. It's, it's, it's a very good article on uh, ecological imperialism and uh, uh, Sajida, uh, if focus of our concern is equitable resource distribution, then we need to move towards labor intensive practices. But if the focus of our development is maximization of profit, then labor intensive practices will not do. Three things which are very important at the moment. Are we in a position to give sufficient cost of agrarian production? Regularly, we see distress among the agrarian section, the, among the peasantry, among the uh, Kisan, that they are not getting enough. They are investing a lot, but they are not getting enough. Similarly, how much do we pay to our maid which are working in our homes? Do we really pay them according to the government norms or according to the basic minimum wage? We are not. So what we are doing in the labor intensive industry, they are underpaid. Since they are underpaid, they become easy source of energy for the industry. But what energy is not realizing, what industry is not realizing, especially in Indian context, that this kind of development will lead to elimination of market for them. And this is what is happening at the moment. It is the middle class who is dictating. Fortunately or unfortunately in India, middle class is much larger. It's a much bigger entity. Because of that, the policies of government are not geared towards or not oriented towards the common man. Rather, because the middle class is much more vocal, middle class is much more visible on the media. So it is the middle class who is dictating the policies of the government to a great extent. In that sense, this labor intensive practices have become the the latest craze uh, the, the 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 green green technology have become the latest craze our traditional practices are themselves green but we don't want to use them because we want to use the term technology i agree even the scientists are aware that there are emissions there are pollution and wherever possible reduce that and produce green technology but green technology in itself is a capitalist production they want to sell their produce now in terms of green technology. What they are eliminating, what they are not making us aware of, what they are hiding 
is that they are once again moving in the same trap of 24 hour seven days a week because even that green technology will become cost effective become cost effective only if it is mass produced that process of mass production produ production itself requires greater energy resources so technology might be green but the kind of energy they are using that is problem for us and the kind of consumption which it may produce which it may generate is also problematic for us so we have to see in terms of its production process the kind of investment is going in the green production and in, in the green technology and the kind of for the consumption it is promoting so it's not only the technology in itself but technology in the context which is where it is being implemented or produced it's a much larger question those who are interested can also uh, explore another a very uh, excellent ngo who is working on these alternatives is vikalp by ashish kothari vikalp is working with the uh, different part of uh, peasant and the artisans and the tribes in different parts of India and they are promoting their local labor intensive technology in place of what we call green technology. They say their technology in itself is a green technology. Why don't we use them? Because they cannot be mass produced. They cannot be exported rather than export produce, export dependent or uh, market driven green technology. If in our attitude move we move towards a technology which is much more feasible perhaps there is an answer but i must confess there is no one clear-cut answer with any one of us had it been with us we would have solved the problem we can only suggest alternatives which may be feasible in one locality may not be feasible in other locality may be feasible in one case may not be feasible in another case so we need to locally adopt that Local means even at the level of family itself, family uh, also. I hope uh, I have, I know I cannot satisfy because uh, in a, uh, let me give you another example. <clears throat> when we use the term sustainable development, then we most of the time, the question which bothers me, sustainable development of whom, for whom, by whom. Sustainable development of humans, only humans or animals also or flora also, or landscape also, or waterscape also. There is no clear cut answer with me. What is preferred, the development or environment? But we need to maintain that balance dependent upon our own local location where we are situated and with a different mindset. Mindset where we are not focusing on maximization of profit. Those who are interested can also see uh, in the times of trees and sorrows and gods in gold and uh, Bhojuram Gujar's classic text on this debate in the times or uh, in the times of trees and sorrows I'll share that uh, reference I don't have the book the soft copy with me but she raises an important question uh Naveen do we have time 10 minutes yes sir we have time we have time we can take uh, Sajita, then, then let me share one example from that book uh, what the ladies did, she was an anthropologist. She uh, did a survey in the area of Ajmer. There is a Sarwar principality in Ajmer area. She interviewed the person who have survived independence, those who were living prior to independence and survived independence. And she was asking only two questions. What is your understanding of development and what is your understanding of environment? Okay, development and environment. Yes. <laughs> Please ask your question or let me respond, then I'll come back to you. Sir, please carry on. I think there was some voice uh, coming from somewhere. Uh, technology is uh, When she interviewed a lady who was in 80s and that lady said that, I don't know what development means. I don't know what environment means. What I know for sure that since that time, the floor mill has come to our village my family don't go hungry when I'm ill. Earlier when I was ill, there was nobody to grind the grain in the family in the morning at four o'clock. Because unless we grind the grain, there was no floor available us, with us for the bread. Now with the availability of flour mill in the village, me, my family gets food regularly. Now it's a billion dollar question for us. Should we oppose this technology 
or should we go back to traditional green technology based on that home grinding machine which we call chakki i don't have answer even she also raises this point that this is the dilemma with which we are continuously struggling we are fighting against but the notion of development is very very different at different level the thing which i can say or what my understanding says is that there are things which are basic amenities there are things which are luxury we have to segregate that and reduce our consumption of luxuries as far as we can the greater we can do that the better we will be in a position i hope i have uh, i have tried my best sanjita to respond to your question so it's, it's a very tricky question nandini what has a question so do you think that these changes and shifts are possible in capitalist model so yes they are or better shift to a different model of economy society eventually prove more efficient by the spread and bringing uh nandini uh, i briefly mentioned in my presentation that unfortunately even the communist societies who were arguing in terms of economic equality even when they imagine development it was based on industrial development so the alternative to capitalism which was there had the same problem they were also trying to use industry as a solution as a panacea to all the problems but gradually with the growth of environmental movement now we are in a position to say that both these formulations are problematic capitalism has been shrewd enough when i say foldism that is the stage where capitalism transcended the barrier of limiting uh, limited availability of market and reimagine itself now by sharing the profit they have created an avenue through which profit can be maximized they created the whole market through which they can maximize their profit so capitalism was shrewd enough in that sense but over the years at least for the last 50 years in particular the or the capitalist philosophy has this limitation because they focus on industrial industrialization as a solution to the problems industry has its own relevance but over production simply because you have to run your machine continuously is a problematic proposition is a problematic proposition that is based on because we want to maximize the profit we need to change that orientation if i give you another example at the current moment of time there are two arguments going simultaneously how government should respond to covid one argument one section of economist ananda ananda is sitting here they argue that greater expenditure from the government will lead to fiscal deficit and which might be create problem as we saw in the 1990s but the other school says that this is the precise movement where government movement where government should unleash its coffer and let the people get the benefit of uh, physical uh, incentive provided by the government that will generate producing capacity that will produce that will generate the consumption capacity of the common man which will ultimately sustain the industrial production which will ultimately sustain the industrial economy which we are witnessing at the moment but both of them have the same problem they want to produce maximum output that is where the problem is we are not challenging the nature of capitalist economy rather we are trying to develop a bypass through which we can restrain then this industrial economy we need to reorient ourselves fortunately we could survive covid because of two primary reason mortality rate is very very low fortunately mortality rate in india is very very low and secondly our agrarian production was sufficient available, sufficiently available with us to make as a to uh, uh, to be uh, used as a buffer against the poverty that agrarian production is the mainstay not the industrial production so we need to change our priorities in what ways this whole economy has to reorient itself towards more satisfactory living rather than more affluent living we can say that the 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 blame can be on us that since you are enjoying all the benefit you can say this no we also all of us need to change our attitude wherever possible to whatever extent we must uh, move in that direction 
or in other words as gandhi used to say this earth is sufficient for everybody to feed not for their greed we need to reduce our greed what we tend to realize that if you purchase this you will be given this we might not need this but since it is given free with this we go for this also and later on we keep dump it at our place that attitude has to be changed because it is the market who is dictating our consumption pattern it's the market who is dictating our lifestyle we need to change that and for that it's the economy will not orient itself social attitude will force the economy to reorient itself that is my understanding nandini may be faulty but that is where we are trying to argue through our teachers against climate change most of the speakers have argued in terms of that we need to revisit our priorities of our own existence that is where we are uh, uh, please at the moment thank you very much sir for uh, taking up all those questions and 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 and, and so patiently answering all those questions and so we had a really interactive discussion session at the end uh, once again uh, is there any more questions uh, coming up i think not okay navin i have my email with you have my email yes sir if they want anything on that they can always contact us because we want sure, to develop sir. the network they are the uh, the carrier of our ideas so it 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 will be a pleasure if we keep on interacting in the uh, later phase of uh, our life as well i i will share your uh, no mail id with the participants and they can directly contact you if they wish any clarification on any of the topics that we discussed today yeah. so uh, thank you very much sir for actually uh, you know for being here for that really enlightening and and informative talk and then we had a really good interactive session at the end and uh, i hope all the participants have benefited immensely from all the discussions that we had today uh, uh, once again on the behalf of the ip college community and on behalf of all the participants i would like to extend my sincere thanks to you for being here thank you sir thanks, Naveen. i enjoyed it and hope we will keep on interacting with each other in the new course of time sure thank sir you. sure sir thank Great. you very much sir bye for participants i would like to uh, you know give you a small piece of announcement uh, here to make uh, so i would request you to kindly adhere to the schedule of assignment submission because uh, you now we are almost nearing the end of our course and uh, you know as soon as you will be submitting all your assignments there are on the, one of the mandatory requirements for completion of this certificate course and we will be going into the validatory session on 15th so i would request you to finish uh, all the assignments uh, most of you have submitted assignment 1 some of you have also submitted assignment 2 uh, before so uh, those who haven't done so kindly submit all the three assignments before uh, uh, unit uh, before 14th of september so that we can go to the validatory and uh, we can uh, you know distribute certificates and everything uh, you know in a much more organized manner and the other thing about the next day is uh, the uh, the session on 12th so we are going to have a gap of one day on 12th of september we are going to have some film screenings i just want to give you a a brief introduction uh, to what we are going to do to, to do on there is so something uh, some very interesting uh, you no know, films and and uh, you no know, we will be showing you now one of them is uh, you know, i'll just keep uh, it as a little bit of surprise to you uh, is one of the only documentary film which was released in a pvr cinemas and uh, it has been really one of the most blue chip film uh, you know in terms of a wildlife documentary in terms of a nature documentary which is released to india we have worked a lot uh, in bringing that to you uh, you know by seeking permissions from the producers of the film so uh, let us uh, you know uh, uh, let us all uh, you know gather again on 12th and and let's uh, you know watch those interesting films that we would be screening thank you very much if you have any question anything that you want to ask uh, you can uh good afternoon sir sir could you please share the email address of uh, um the the speaker for the day thanks so, uh, okay so that. so what i'll do is that before i leave uh, before we leave for the today's session i'll just put it in the comment box that will be it will be easy for you to copy it from there thank you sir thank you good afternoon sir am i audible ha ah, yes sir so you are audible Yes. Sir, in the last class, I think uh, Ma'am told that the third, uh, the the fourth week and the third week assignments are merged. Okay, so uh, what we have done, we had a discussion on that, uh, and for the fourth 
assignment we are going to have an open discussion session on 15th itself on the validatory day because we thought that it is it, is, it may not be very uh, you know, uh, wise to give you an assignment even before we have finished the whole uh, unit so uh, for the assignment one two and three are for the first three respective units the fourth unit we will be we will just keep it as an open discussion session on the validatory day so let us have uh, bring up come up with our own ideas and what we have learned through this entire course in in past four weeks we will have a good discussion over there and that that's the, that will be the uh, the end of the assignments okay? okay thank you sir thank you Rishma. as far as all the literature and other uh, you know uh, readings that uh, Dr. Mayank has suggested, I will be mailing it to you or what I can do is that I can put it, I have put up the, uh, no, the mail ID of this today's speaker in the chat box and uh, all other uh, study materials and readings, I will mail it to you or put it on the courses website or at both the places. Thank you.